Dear colleagues, uh, welcome to our EHJ dialogue. The successful story of our dialogues continues. Uh, I remind you that our dialogues are live streamed, uh, not only in YouTube, but also in Twitter. Uh, I remind you also that uh, our dialogues are very interactive. So please ask questions. Uh, you can raise your physical hands uh, or your virtual hands. Uh, and it's really our pleasure to involve you in our dialogue. Uh, today, we have a very, very interesting dialogue with uh, a famous guest, who is Peter Schwartz, who is also editor of the European Air Journal. And I will host him with uh, uh, Perry Elliott, who is the executive editor of the European Air, jo uh, European Air Journal. And we have a very exciting title for this dialogue from long QT syndrome to precision medicine in channelopathies, a 50 year journey. So this is really a long story. So be, uh, be ready to listen to this fantastic story which started 50 years ago. And now it's my pleasure to ask Perry to introduce Peter. Please, Perry. Lipo, thanks. So once again, a great pleasure to be involved in this in this dialogue. And Peter, a really great privilege to, to have a conversation with you. So as always, we always say this, but I think it really is true in your case. You don't really need a great deal of introduction. But perhaps the most important fact about you, of course, is that you were born in the UK. Um, but for some reason, you rapidly left and you became one of the giants of Italian cardiology. Um, where, having qualified from the University of Milan, you went on to, to specialise in cardiology. And that's essentially where you remain as director of the Centre for Cardiac Arrhythmias of Genetic Origin. But of course, you're also a, a man who crosses countries and crosses continents, and you have important positions at the University of Stellenbosch and, and Cape Town. Um, your career is, you know, you've, you've had numerous leadership roles, both within Italy and um, for example, leading the Italian Cardiac Society, but also internationally, where I think you've, you've made really important contributions to both the way in which we think about arrhythmias, um, arrhythmic drugs, and the management of complex arrhythmia. I mean, you were one of the leading lights in the, in the CAST trial, Cardiac Arrhythmia Suppression Trial. And of course, you were one of the key players behind what we then called the Sicilian Gambit, about a new way of of classifying antiarrhythmic drugs. But of course, I think you, everybody will, will know you now as, as someone who spent your, your entire career focusing on the autonomic system as it relates to the heart and particularly important diseases that cause sudden death in young people. And I think your contributions to, to long QT syndrome in particular are, you know, I think, certainly for those of us in the inherited cardiac disease community, I think your greatest contribution. So we're really looking forward to a, an exciting conversation about you, your past, and, and of course, your future. <laughs> so, so Peter, maybe we can start at the beginning. I mean, is it really true that you started off as a hypertension doctor? No, I started working with Professor Zanchetti, who was a world leader in hypertension, but who also was a, a physiologist uh, who started his work uh, with the central nervous system. I started working in his institute because it was one of the very few in Italy in the late 60s, mid 60s, that was publishing at the top level uh, uh, everything they were doing. So I started working in his institute. I actually never worked on hypertension, which, <clears throat> which I always regarded as a rather boring disease where the maximal excitement comes from shifting blood pressure by a few millimeters up and down. So I became interested in sudden death where people drop that all of a sudden. And uh, uh, to work with him was very important because he had an open mind and never pressured me to work on hypertension. And uh, actually I began uh, the initial work with Alberto Magliani, who was my first mentor. And, and you've told us how your story with long QT syndrome in particular began. And I think it's quite unusual to remember the very first patient that stimulated you know, the, whole, the rest of your career. Would you like to maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was uh, 
January 1971, when we had this little girl, uh, eight year old, uh, her name was Agostina, who came to us uh, because uh, her sister, who was 18 year old, and uh, died suddenly during a live TV program. Uh, and uh, she went on all newspapers because that was seen by everyone in Italy at that time. And when the girl came to us, brought by her mother, it was because she had fainted uh, as uh, the same way of, of her sister. Whenever she was getting emotional or she was running or she was frightened, uh, she would lose consciousness. So there was a clear relationship between the sympathetic nervous system and her condition. But we had no idea about the diagnosis. I mean, it took a, a few months uh, going back to the library, talking with people before we made the diagnosis of a long syndrome. And the QT interval was indeed a very, very, very long one. She happened to end up in one of the four beds at the University Hospital in Milan, where I had a little bit of responsibility. I mean, I, I was no one. I mean, I was just a, a very junior doctor with no experience whatsoever. And uh, at the beginning of our studies, we, one day we wanted to have an exercise stress test performed. Uh, and when the girl entered in the room, she was frightened. And she said, I feel sick, I feel sick. So we uh, laid her down with an ECG and uh, her T waves were going up and down, up and down. Uh, now, I, I never, I was never very good with electrocardiography, so I had no idea on what was going on. I turned, uh, I was smiling, but that is true. I mean, I'm not good. I can measure the QT interval, though. Uh, <laughs> so I turned to a, towards the senior cardiologist and asked him, What is this? And he said, these are very ugly T waves, which is not a very scientific explanation. So I went down to the library, eventually realized that the phenomenon was called T wave alternance. And looking at the index medicus, because in those days it was the only uh, point of reference, uh, at my institute we had the index medicus from 1920 to 1970. I checked every single month for the 50 years. And there were only seven cases in the entire world published on two of alternates, but the few cases described on long QT syndrome, most of them were showing T of alternates. So I start thinking that there might have been a relationship between the two. And this was the beginning of the thing, because once I was able to reproduce T of alternates and prolongation of the QT interval, we decided, based also on some other studies, to perform left sympathectomy in Agostina, which we did in March 1973. And she stopped completely having any attack, any problem. She died because of an accident uh, six years ago. But we developed a very important uh, personal relationship. She came to see me and we were visiting her every single year. Uh, she became a sort of a daughter, and she said that I was a sort of a second father. And as a matter of fact, there are two, as I wrote once, our two lives crossed at one point and had a major impact on both of them, on both of us. On one hand, I probably saved her life. And on the other, she almost unconsciously forced me to change my research activity and to focus on the long PT syndrome, with results that I have never regret. Mm. Was she the first in the family to have this? No, she was the second. The first one was her elder sister who died suddenly, and that was what started. But she also has another sister, a younger one, uh, also one who suffered cardiac arrest. We did sympathectomy when she was five years old. She's perfectly fine now. I see her every single year. And if you think back to that, that experience I mean, and compare it to, to how we ma manage and diagnose such cases now, I mean, is it a complete miracle or are we still missing these kind of cases? I mean, what do you think we've learned from Agostina over the past 50 years? Well, we've learned a lot and a number of things are different, but in those days, uh, we were really in an unknown world. We had no ideas on what could be done. We had no ideas about therapies. We start using beta blockers because there was a relationship between the triggers uh, for her uh, syncope and uh, loss of consciousness, but that was all we knew. Uh, I was lucky because uh, working at my institute, 
we were doing a clinical work in the morning until one o'clock. Then we were entering in the research laboratory. Uh, our main thing in the, the initial days was to record single fibers in the sympathetic and vagal nerves. And uh, that offered me the possibility of doing experiments, trying to reproduce what she had. And one day, and that was probably the most exciting moment in my life, uh, uh, I was able to reproduce T web alternance by stimulating the left thread ganglion. So, both the prolongation of the QT interval and this very unusual phenomenon could be elicited by stimulating the left sided sympathetic nerves, which meant probably that removing them, we would have afforded protection. And that has guided my reserves throughout the 70s when I explored mostly in dogs in a variety of uh, sudden death models the impact of left cardiac sympathetic innervation on the probability to develop arrhythmias. So that discovery of, of if you like, the, the, new, the neurological components of this was, was critical, wasn't it? What, was, what are the other landmarks in the story of long QT syndrome, do you think? Well, clearly the efficacy of beta blockers was a, a main point. The uh, understanding that removing left cardiac sympathetic nerves, I think, still is a major issue. Uh, there are unfortunately countries in which this surgery is not done. Uh, Mike Ackerman started uh, 20 years ago in the United States, which has uh, an important impact in the development. I mean, for almost 30 years, I was uh, uh, doing it by myself practically. I was traveling with my surgeon all over the world and doing it, but uh, it was a little bit difficult because it seemed that uh, it was a personal obsession. Now, finally, it is evident that the procedure, which is now much simpler because with uh, thoracoscopy, uh, it takes 40 minutes, uh, three holes under the axilla I mean, without opening the chest, is a much easier surgery. And it is important because it represents an intermediate step between a failure to beta blockers when that happened and the implant of an ICD, which has a lot of uh, uh, significant adverse effects. So that is a, a, a major a major point in terms of therapy. Um, where do you think the, the genetics fit in in this story over the past 50 years? How did, how did that change the way in which we think that about these diseases? A lot. I mean, for a variety of reasons. On one point, it has strengthened the diagnosis. Of course, we were making the diagnosis before 1995, uh, but certainly genetics have helped. Uh, the... Uh, what we learned at the beginning of, of this millennium uh, with a different impact of specific genes uh, on the triggers has been very important. I mean, to realize that the <clears throat> conditions which are relevant to the onset of arrhythmias can be specific according to the gene has led to gene-specific management. I mean, this was probably one of the big things that we, we did at the end of the 90s uh, when my group proposed, for instance, the use of mexilatine for uh, LQT3 patients and now uh, also for LQT2. Uh, but also it has guided management. For instance, as an example, the realization that patients with the so-called LQT2 type are at greater risk when they wake up in the morning, in the first few hours, if there is a sudden noise or something like that, has uh, led us to suggest that the treatment with beta blockers, instead of giving them once a day in the morning, for LQT2, we give it morning and evening, so that we try to keep a higher level, a uh, higher therapeutic level also in the morning. So there are a number of ways in which genetics have impacted, and they can still impact a lot. So uh, I'd love to come back and talk to you about those in, in a second, but I'm just going to hand back to Filippo maybe to, to pick up on a few more of the, the broader elements of, of what it is that makes you Peter Schwartz. <laughs> Filippo. Well, Peter, it's really a fascinating story. And what uh, is impressive is that uh, all, uh, all stems from a clinical observation. I mean, was that particular patient, that particular ECG clinical observation leading to clinical research? And I think this is a very important message for our young colleagues in particular, because we are flooded by artificial intelligence, scores, and, uh, and uh, uh, fancy imaging, but we tend to forget 
that our main device is our brain. And when the brain works well, as in your case, then uh, really results can be remarkable. But if you can comment on scores in particular. You touched on a very important point because again, I, I regard myself as being very, very lucky in, in all my scientific career, uh, but that was facilitated by the fact that since day one, uh, in terms of my, my getting my MD degree, I was dividing my time between the clinic and the experimental lab. And uh, the clinical setting, the patients were and are providing the questions, even now. That is the most important source, is the question that uh, you have to face when dealing with patients. But then you need the next step, in the either the laboratory or the uh, now genetics and everything that goes with that uh, is where you try to answer the questions. So again, I, I regarded myself as very fortunate because I had the opportunity to see the patients, realize the problems, and then within a few hours moving to my experimental lab, working with either cats or dogs, and then try to get the answers. Uh, for example, uh, Perry was uh, asking about uh, the important moments in, in, in my story. Uh, it was not only the reproduction of two of at one point, but a few years later, when I start looking at the impact on the threshold for ventricular fibrillation by uh, interfering with the autonomic nervous system, I remember the incredible excitement of realizing that by blocking uh, the left cardiac sympathetic nerves, the threshold for ventricular fibrillation would increase by 70% or more, which meant that taking away these nerves, it would be more difficult for a heart to fibrillate. And that, of course, has implications that go well beyond long QT syndrome. In a sense, any condition where patients have a high likelihood of developing ventricular fibrillation, removal of these nerves can be very protective, simply because by blocking the release of norepinephrine in the heart, uh, this is preventing uh, the onset of ventricular fibrillation. And this still leaves open the possibility of drugs and even an ICD. Uh, Peter, uh, another important person in your life has been Peter Zwart. Uh, this is the translation of your name in Dutch. Has uh, been the second important person in your life after Agostina, but he lived 200 years ago. Why is a person who lived 200 years ago so important for your career? Well, this man, Peter Zwart, uh, arrived in South Africa in 1690 at a time when there was the so-called Company of the Indies. I mean, the Dutch were using South Africa as a basis uh, to move to Asia and uh, to uh, purchase all uh, the things they were interested in. Now, this man stopped and started working in Stellenbosch, uh, and he had long pity syndrome, type 1. Uh, we have been able to trace that uh, together with my partner in, uh, in Stellenbosch, Professor Paul Brink, a very dear friend, uh, the story of this family, because over 330 years, the members of this family have multiplied. Now we are following almost 500 members of those families, of the initial family, and uh, almost half of them have long QT syndrome type 1. Now, when I heard about this in the late 90s, I realized that that was a fantastic opportunity to study what we call modifier genes, because we could have been dealing with a large number of individuals all having long QT syndrome and having the same identical mutations. Now, we knew that 80% of them were with symptoms, cardiac arrest and sudden death, but 20% had no symptoms whatsoever, despite having the same mutation. So that led up on one hand uh, to our building a house in South Africa and spending three months there uh, with funding from NIH for 10 years, so $7 million, but led especially to my interest in modifier genes, which expressed simply, uh, you could imagine it in this way, why is it that within a family with a genetic disorder, you have two siblings with the same mutation, one who has syncope, cardiac arrest, and dies suddenly, and the other one has no symptoms, nothing. Why is that? We believe that this is depending on other genetic variants that we call modifier genes. 
So the Peter Schwartz, the Dutch man, was important to me because uh, it led to this cooperation in South Africa and to my research, which is still ongoing, on modifier genes, which I believe uh, are a key for a more selective risk stratification and for a more specific uh, uh, management of the disease. Okay, so the fascinating story continues. All started with Agostina, then uh, Peter Swart uh, has opened a new uh, avenue regarding modify, modified genes. Uh, but now this uh, recent interest, because you never raised on your success, you're always very productive. And one of your recent interests are inducible pluripotent stem cells. Now, can you summarize for our audience why is the this technology is so important, and why is so important in particular in your field of interest? Yeah, uh, well, the technology um, was derived by Shina Yamanaki, who got uh, uh, 20 years ago the Nobel Award, uh, as essentially enables all of us to take uh, uh, blood, explore, uh, taking blood cells, and uh, to uh, transform them in pluripotent stem cells that can then be differentiated in cardiomyocytes. So at the end of the day, I say end of the day, but it takes uh, almost one year, you end up with uh, the cardiac cells of your patient that contain exactly the same genetic background. Then we can do cellular electrophysiology and study the responses of the cells of our patients uh, to a variety of drugs, to a variety of stimulation. This is a fantastic way to explore new therapies, for example. So uh, when I realized that, I, I expanded my group in terms of developing uh, a, the area of cellular electrophysiology. We have a fantastic lab for that. So practically, we go from the patient, from the traditional genetics, uh, to the development of the stem lines and to cardiac electrophysiology, which, again, I think is opening a very large number of possibilities. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I remind our audience that you can ask questions. So please, if you have uh, questions, we are happy to involve you in our, in our discussion. Uh, uh, Peter, let's come back to your life. Uh, in, a, in one of your papers, uh, I noted an interesting uh, sentence. You wrote, shyness has never been my weakness. Uh, what is the uh, lesson for our younger colleagues? And uh, why uh, are your recommendations, what are your recommendations for them? I mean, this is an interesting, intriguing sentence. Can you tell more about it? Okay, but by that time, I meant when I wrote it that uh, I was never afraid of dissenting from powerful people, be they the directors or whatever. And there is one anecdote that I like to share with my students because I think it was informative. When I was uh, only 30 years old, uh, in uh, January 1974, uh, I had just arrived to work for three years in Galveston, Texas. One day I went to New Orleans uh, to talk and meet uh, with uh, Dr. George Birch. Birch had been the very famous uh, editor of the American Heart Journal for about 30 years. Very difficult man, rather aggressive. So I was allowed to sit down with him and he said, what are you doing? I tried to tell him the story of Agostina and say that, that one day I've seen an extremely rare phenomenon, T. web alternates, and I gave the figure to him. He looked at the figure and said, rare, I've seen it hundreds of times, and threw the figure on the table. Now, you are 30 year old in a foreign country, what do you do? You take your figure and disappear. But as I said earlier, I had read everything since 1920 through 1970, so I knew everything on that very little topic. So he looked at Dr. George Birch and said, you are wrong, I don't believe you. And then I mean, he started looking at me with big eyes and I added, probably you've seen QRS alternates that is much more common. Eventually he looked at the figure again and after what looked to me as an eternity, he said, you know what, you are right, I was wrong. Why don't you start all over again? He kept me there for two hours. And one week later, he invited me to write the first review article on long QT syndrome. And that was really a turning point in my career. And it was all dependent on the fact that on the one hand, I knew everything on that little topic. Second, I was not shy. And I told him, you are wrong. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, now our audience is asking questions. 
Uh, in particular, uh, I can read a question from Aris Papadopoulou, Papadopoulou, who is, uh, I think, can ask this question directly. Is Ari there? Aris, are you there? Uh, if not, yes. I can. Yes, I'm here, sorry. Oh, yes. Hi. Yes, hi. Hi. Please. Thank you so much. It's a very exciting discussion. Um, I couldn't resist, um, but uh, I'm very interested in modifier genes. And I was wondering whether the ones that you're looking at are mainly protein coding genes or there's anything from the non coding genome? They are both. Okay. And, uh, yeah, what do you think is the, where is the balance uh, towards? Well, I would put it in another way, if you don't mind. Uh, we are really in a learning phase. We are discovering more and more modifier genes. Uh, and now we are beginning also to understand their mechanism of action, which I think is the most fascinating thing. We had a, a paper on that in cardiovascular research because in the moment we start understanding how they work, uh, these can help us to design new therapies. So the main issue is uh, to be certain that certain variants can indeed uh, have an impact in modifying the outcome for the patient. And then you take it from there. But again, it's uh, I've been working on it for only 20 years. So in, in, in the next 20 years, we'll find more. Uh, Peter, I have another question before coming back to Perry. Perry, uh, in your life, uh, you've been in touch with many important colleagues. Uh, which collaborations have been the most important in your life, perhaps starting with Alberto Zanchetti? Uh, collaborations have been very important in my life, without no question. I, there are two, though, that have, were very important. The first one was with Buzz Brown, uh, a basic science physiologist who were always published in science in nature. He used to come at the end of the 60s to work in Alberto Magliani laboratory. And uh, on the first day of his visits, we very young, we were 25, 26, 27 years old, uh, were making a proposal for a project for that summer. Uh, one, one day, well, one year, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, his name was Massimo Pagani, proposed uh, a project that was very complex, a lot of biofeedback systems. And when he ended, uh, Buzz Brown said, so what? And there was a dead silence. I mean, because the guy couldn't answer the question about what is it? And then I remember that I told myself, you should always be able to answer this question when you design a study. So what? I mean, what is going to be the result? The other partnership that was very important was the one with Artmos. Uh, Artmos was uh, not an easy person to deal with. We had a number of uh, good moments and bad moments, but it was a critical partnership because uh, uh, in 1977, we sat together at the ACC meeting in uh, Vegas, and we decided to start the registry, International Registry for Long Body Syndrome. Um, during breakfast, Artmos asked me, Peter, for how many years should we try to have this registry? And I say the 25 years, which per se indicates how young we were uh, in those days. And we actually continued that registry for 25 years, and that has provided fantastic information that was not available at the time about the natural history, a response to therapy, uh, by getting the very large families with a complete pedigree about affected and unaffected. These provided the geneticists with the essential uh, tools uh, uh, to develop uh, the screening for genes subsequently. So the genes were, these two partnerships were certainly fundamental. I was lucky having many more, but these are the two that uh, played a major role. Well, this is very important because uh networking and public relations, if you want, in science are very important. And this uh, networking eventually is very productive. But I read another question, Perry, so I'll come back to you just a second. Uh, we, I read a, a question from a colleague, Philomine Guemo. Uh, Peter, our audience is really global from, from one continent to another. And the question is about translation from I in, inducible pluripotent stem cells uh, towards the clinic is a big gap. Do you, do you think that this big gap can be filled quickly? This is the sense of this question. Yes, uh, we actually already started doing that. I mean, uh, 
Um, already several years ago, we demonstrated uh, that in uh, IPS from our patients, especially from patients LQT2 with a trafficking defect, uh, there is a compound that is used for totally different uh, clinical conditions that can correct the trafficking defect. So we observed that first in uh, uh, our cardiomyocytes from our patients, and then we started a clinical trial, which is ongoing, in which we get patients with the specific condition, which means a trafficking defect and LQT2. And we are following them for one week in hospital with this compound. And we are getting some very interesting results. The study is ongoing. I can't say much more than that. But that, I think, is a good example of using the IPS technology to identify and then test in humans this possibility uh, for those patients, not many, who fail with current therapy. But I think it's important, Filippo, that we all keep in mind that independently of all the exciting new possibilities, what we are doing now is already very good for the patients. Uh, the treatments we have, which are not new, I mean, uh, we're talking of beta blockers, uh, sympatectomy, the old uh, sodium channel blocker, mexilatin, are effective in the vast majority of patients, and there is a small number that may require an ICD. But with that, I mean, a, a disease that uh, can kill without any question is really under control. Thank you. Peter, uh, when you ask written questions, please also say where you come from, your country. Perry, back to you. So Peter, I, I just want to take that last point. Oh, first of all, can I ask you, has, has anybody told you that you were wrong? <laughs> and are they still alive? <laughs> I, I, I would never say that to you, Peter, but, but you're, you're very, you've always passionately believed that long QT syndrome is a treatable disease in the way that you've just described. But, but there must be some unmet need there must, you know, there must be a f some frontiers in, in the management of long QT syndrome that we still need new solutions for. I mean, wh what are those in your view? Well, I think the, the most difficult issue is to deal with those infants who have cardiac events in the first year of life. Right. And we realized that about 15 years ago that uh, uh, this group is very difficult to manage, uh, is not well protected by what we have now. Um, these infants, uh, I said once when dealing with my first patient with a calmodulin mutation, I said that these infants are not meant to live. And I meant, what I meant was that without uh, an ICD implanted in a three, four months old baby, they would have been dead. But as a matter of fact, we, knew we need to do much better than that. So we need to find uh, appropriate therapies that do not result in shock all the time uh, for this group of patients. There are not many, but these are very difficult patients. It is a struggle to keep them under control. And it's a difficult battle also because we have to imagine the pain in the families. I mean, uh, often we're dealing with uh, young parents, the first child, and, you know, it, it's a difficult situation, but th this is a big challenge. This is where I would, uh, uh, we are spending time on that without any question. Mm -hmm. Another question for you. The beta blocker story is, is unequivocally true. I mean, you can dramatically reduce events. But when we look at the event rates, particularly in long QT2, for example, there is still an annual mortality in that group. And when we're, and when we're dealing with young people, I, I, have we really thought about what acceptable mortality is for this disease? And where I'm coming from on this, I, I, I think it's something we do very poorly in cardiology, where we have a paradigm for coronary disease or for heart failure, or in my world, in cardiomyopathy. But when we think about the absolute risks, we're, we're often talking about very different ways of thinking. And on QT syndrome, you know, the, the vulnerable period is in, in teenage years, the young adults. Yeah, what is an acceptable mortality, residual mortality? I tend to say zero, but I know that yeah. exists. Now, as I said, one should keep separate the infants with symptoms in the first year of life. So they are a different story. For the others, I might have been lucky, but I, I mean, the last patient I lost, and we see, I mean, at my place, we have six, eight families every single day. 
And the last patient uh, that I was uh, following with I was uh, 35 years ago. It was a patient who refused to take beta blocker. So it was not treatable because of a direct refusal. Uh, I think that if you see the patients regularly, I think a key issue in the management is uh, uh, to do what we do, which is to see all of our patients once every single year, because the risk changes. It's not a stable risk. To assume that you see a patient for the first time today, you can assess risk and then forget about it and just send the patient away is foolishness. Uh, the risk is changing. And we need to adapt our therapies to the change in risk. If we do that, uh, improving and uh, uh, modifying the therapy according to the risk that is changing, mortality can be very close to zero. Again, I was lucky adding a zero mortality for 35 years, but I think that's not an unattainable situation. Of course, we have to use everything. There are many situations where people just go from a syncope on beta blockers, which is a partial failure, uh, partial because the patient had an event but didn't die, to implant an ICD. And now to implant an ICD also conveys a lot of uh, significant problems. So sometimes people are hesitating between the two. This is the area where using left cardiac sympathetic denervation reduces further the risk. And then, if necessary, you can still implant an ICD, having the sympathectomy to prevent the arrhythmias. And uh, the ICD is a safety net, but with minimal concerns because the patients don't start having arrhythmias. So, I'm not pessimistic at all. I think that. Uh, this is a deadly disease when it's not well treated. If it's treated carefully, with passion, because you have to take time with your patients. For instance, I'm lucky because since I don't do private practice, I spend with the patients and their families all the time that is necessary for that family. Explaining the questions, explaining why the disease is dangerous, what could be done and what should not be done. And then I think the results pay because these patients do well and they can have, most of them can have a practically completely normal life with some exception for a competitive sports, perhaps, for some of them. Yeah, I think that's a really important message. But uh, Peter, if you look at what's happening in the world at the moment of gene therapy, I mean, there's a lot of excitement in, in hairy cardiovascular disease more generally. I mean, I've had more conversations with you know, developers of, of new therapeutic projects in the past three years than I had in the previous 30 years. But in, in the specific instance of long QT syndrome, given what you've just said, do you, do you think there are, there's a, a gap there for gene therapy? For, you know, could we imagine cure of the disease non-pharmacologically? Well, we, we all like to dream, and uh, we also tried years ago uh, to silence the mutation in rats and so on. I think it's a fascinating area, something that needs to be pursued because it has the potential of becoming very useful. Uh, I think it's also fair to distinguish between what is uh, very attractive from an experimental point of view and the research point of view, which must be pursued because that is how progress is made. So that's a fundamental area. On the other side, we have to be careful in assessing what are our results now, because with our almost all the therapies, we are doing so well and in a safe way. So, Gene therapy also, I think it has to be, will be implemented at one point, especially for those cases that are not well protected by traditional therapies. Because uh, uh, if I have a, a, a son or a grandchild with long QT syndrome, uh, I would like to make sure that we don't deal only with the efficacy of therapy, but with safe, safety. Safety is extremely important. So, it, I mean, I think we should pursue it uh, carefully uh, without, not, without jumping uh, onto it and uh, realizing that we already have very effective therapies. That's a really important point. A, a question I was going to ask you myself, actually, but the, the role of mexilatine in the management for long QT syndrome. I'm still not very clear on that myself, to be honest. I mean, what, Peter, what's your view on this? Well, you know, the, the exhilarating story really goes back to, to the end of March in 1995. I mean, I, I was shot on a Friday night while I was uh, in Switzerland to ski by learning that on Monday, Cell would have published two papers on, on the genes. 
And when I read them, I, I was shocked because I told that all my my previous work would have looked like uh, Stone Age work. Uh, so I had to do something and learn about genetics and how to survive in, in the new era. But when it was clear that one of the subgroups was related to an excessive uh, uh, inward current of sodium, well, I mean, it seemed natural to me and, and my sources to think, well, a sodium channel blocker could be useful. So the first thing we did was to call uh, a family with uh, the sodium channel mutation. We had three of them. We gave them mixinitin by mouth, and within two hours, the QT shortened dramatically. So remember that we sent in an abstract to the AHA, and uh, my colleague said, how can we send an abstract with three patients? And uh, my reply was, you don't understand that this is the first gene-specific therapy. And things went on since then, and other people start using it. And uh, it's clear that it's very effective at least in shortening the QT interval. I mean, I've always wanted to distinguish between a purely cosmetic effect and a therapeutic effect. But as a matter of fact, when the QT shortens by more than 50 uh, milliseconds, then uh, you're also having a biological effect. And then, with some surprise, we found that also two-thirds of LQT2 patients respond rather well, which is uh, less easy to understand, but this is a reality. So that's an important uh, plus. Okay. Philippe, I'm going to hand back to you in a second, but just I just be to, in one of my concluding remarks. When you started this conversation, I think you illustrated the that importance of the link between the clinic and the laboratory. And I just wonder what do you think that that link has been weakened as as time has gone past? I mean, we have we live in an incredible time. We have amazing technology, amazing computing power, amazing understanding of molecular biology. But what do you think has happened to that link between the patient sitting there and what we yes. can achieve technology? It's a very sad situation. I think the link has been lost uh, largely uh, and at the beginning because people stopped working on the big, large animals, big animals. And if you don't work on big animals, then you lose uh, the fact that uh, the cardiac is an innervated organ. The autonomic nervous system plays such an important role. In the moment you move to cells only, you lose completely that very important pattern. And uh, what was happening in the past was that uh, cardiologists like me could also do experimental lab and uh, assess uh, in the lab uh, their ideas. Now things are very different. The cardiologists just do clinical cardiology, basic scientists just do that. There is a very little crosstalk. The cardiologists, the clinical cardiologists don't know how to tackle the problem in the lab. And those in the lab have no idea about the clinical problem. So uh, it's a sad, to me, it's a sad situation because uh, uh, it's what is being lost is this contact that Filippo was alluding to between the clinic and the lab which in order to really make a progress for our patient, I think is a very important issue. Filippo, back to you. I, I can read some questions from, from the audience. Uh, there is a question from Emanuela Locati. Emilia, can you unmute? Please, Emanuela, ask your question. Uh, ciao, Peter. It's a pleasure to hear from you the, the long story and the adventure for the discovery of long QT syndrome that I shared with you in part in the past. Nowadays, we have this new observation that uh, epicardial ablation might have a role in a very high risk patient with uh, this uh, study, study we just made, uh, where right ventricle ablation uh, eliminated arrhythmias in very high risk patients with a current ventricular fibrillation. So I would like to hear your opinion about this and if this finding might fit with your original hypothesis of the right to left imbalance being among the important isotetogenetic mechanism in long QT syndrome. Well, are you asking about the ablation? Is that what I'm Correct, yeah. yes. With, with the ablation, with the epicardial mapping, it was discovered that patients with a very severe long QT syndrome may have a, a, a very um, heterogeneous uh, potential duration on the surface, on the epithelial surface. And this could be at the 
So I wonder where these might fit with the original hypothesis of uh, uh, in fact the right to left imbalance in this station being among the two of this disease. Yeah, that hypothesis has never been proven, so we'll have to keep it as a nice memory. It gave ideas for a number of studies we made, and that was important. Uh, but we have no real evidence of uh, uh, a developmental imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. What is clear is <clears throat> that if you uh, cut the nerves at preganglionic level, you have a completed innervation, there will be no innervation, and this is very useful. One has to be very careful if you work uh, on popganglionic nerves, because if you, uh, for instance, do an ablation at pericardial level, for instance, then you do remove uh, the postganglionic nerves, which may have a temporary effect, uh, but over a couple of years, these nerves will uh, grow again and renovate. So I think one has to be very careful with this type of procedures. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Peter, very clear. Uh, we have one last question from uh, Massimo Volpe. Can we unmute Mas Massimo is our, uh, one of our editors and uh, please, you can ask your question directly. Ciao, Peter. Uh, I find you very well. <laughs> uh, listen, I, my question travels from uh, your laboratory in uh, the Physiology Center in Milan and the new technologies today. Uh, the, the, do you have do you have any chance to look at uh, the impact of renal denervation on uh, people with uh, long QT? This is just a curiosity more than uh, uh, no. For yeah, I don't think we'll do that. I, I must confess that I've always been a bit skeptical about uh, the renal denervation as a way to protect the heart because, uh, after all, that is a rather indirect uh, way. I mean, if you uh, it's difficult to imagine that by interrupting afferents from the kidney, and which lead to a reflex activation, you can have something more powerful than directly eliminate the efferent uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system. Uh, so I, I still go by the, 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 the simple and very direct <laughs> approach of eliminating the left side first, I mean, the, from the lower half of the left side ganglion down to the full thoracic ganglion, which eliminates uh, the release of norepinephrine in the heart on the left side. And for a few patients, if that is not sufficient, then we go bilaterally and make also the right, uh, right sympathetic. I mean, that is very seldom necessary, but sometimes we have to do that. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, uh... In life, there is much more beyond long QT syndrome. Something which is definitely more important is golf. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've never understood what is more important in your life, long QT syndrome or golf. We also published on golf, the, the European Art Journal. So I wonder what is more important in your life? More important is brief, but I will explain my result in a, in a minute. Uh, first of all, I published on golf in European Art Journal, as you say, but I also published on golf in The Lancet and in Circulation. And, uh, and I was quoting the most important journal. <laughs> I always do. I need to, to check my impact factors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, golf is important to me because uh, it's a competitive game where you compete against yourself. So it's, it's a technical game which takes you out for several hours. Uh, when I play in a tournament, I can clean my mind because I don't think of anything else but uh, playing as well as I can, which is not very good, but decent. Um, and golf again is lovely because you compete against yourself. But your question was, is it research or golf? And my answer was bridge because uh, the, the real truth, my real passion is uh, uh, playing bridge. My father was a medical doctor, was one of the top bridge players in Italy. And uh, uh, the challenge there is that I know very well that I'll never be as good as my father in playing bridge. Uh, but uh, bridge is what uh, I know that I could play until my last day. I mean, it's, uh, it's a, because, uh, you see, I, before playing bridge, I was a chess player. I mean, my, my story really was playing chess. I like play to play in general, but uh, play is important in life. Uh, I started with chess, bridge, and biomedical research. 
And the three of them have something in common. It's all problem solving. And this is what fascinates me, to solve a problem. Clearly, to solve a biomedical problem is more socially acceptable than solving a bridge problem or a chess problem. Um, but they are all three significant uh, games uh, that keep your neurons active in your brain. Very clear. Something to keep in mind, important message for our colleagues, younger colleagues in particular, how to stimulate our brain, which remains the most important device in our daily life, more important than artificial intelligence. Uh, Peter, uh, you're also a successful editor of the European Art Journal. How can we improve the journal? By not changing is the first rule. The journal is excellent. You should do on as you are doing. Uh, the main message is uh, not to fall prey of the need of accepting articles. So if an article is not good, it should be rejected. Sometimes this may lead to a relatively small number of accepted papers, but uh, more than improving, you should make sure that there is no, no worsening. I mean, it's, you're already doing an extremely good job, Filippo. So keep going uh, in the way you're doing. Uh, simply make sure that if a paper is, does not meet the standards of the journal, it should not be published. Yeah, well, this is a tough lesson for the others who are going to submit the European Art Journal, but this is the case. I mean, uh, we want to publish top science, but we also want to involve our readers and our others' life today. I think that in addition to printing, to, to uh, publishing top science, it is important to create this community, this, this, uh, this common feelings among editors, others, and, uh, and uh, reviewers and readers as we are doing together. So definitely we accept top science only, but the world of cardiology is wider than the top science, and the journal wants to play a role also in uh, creating this community. Uh, well, we are at the end of our dialogue. Uh, Perry, thank you uh, for hosting Peter. Peter, thank you for your fascinating story. Uh, the successful story of the dialogues continues. Next dialogue will be, as usual, on the last Thursday of April, will be April. 27 at uh, 17 Central European time. Thank you again for this brilliant, pleasant and instructive hour. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.